Please welcome Andrea Mitchell, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent, NBC News. Thank you very much. Welcome to all. I am a proud owner of, of course, David's great new book, How to Lead. And I just want to say how delighted I am to be speaking with David about how to lead and all that you've done. David, Warren Buffett just said that you somehow, as a lawyer, a uh, former White House official, obviously the founder of Carlisle, went into a phone booth and came out as this great interviewer, uh, apparently with all the talent of Mac, talents of Max Scherzer with all your, your different pitches. So how do you do it? You're a, a history buff, a philanthropist, obviously a panda lover, as we know from watching the zoo video. Um, you've transformed yourself into a popular, super popular uh, interviewer. How have you managed to do all of this? Well, I've been watching you for many years and gotten a lot of tips. Hardly. <laughs> and um, I've, uh, I really uh, give a lot of credit to the Economic Club of Washington. When I became the president of the Economic Club of Washington, the format was to have speakers come in. And that's what Vernon Jordan, my predecessor, asked me to do. And after a few speakers, I realized that maybe uh, CEOs were very good CEOs, but they may not be gifted speakers. And I thought maybe some people were falling asleep during the speeches. So I decided I would try to maybe interview and liven it up a little bit. And it took off. And so I developed a skill at doing it for a number of years. And then Bloomberg saw that and they said, why don't you do it on, on Bloomberg and now on PBS? So it was the Economic Club of Washington that gave me a chance to do this. And the, the technique is not that complicated. I do a lot of research, as you do. And I prepare the questions in my mind. And then I kind of memorize them a bit. And then I try to in, intersperse some humor. But I always try to do it in a way where I'm not embarrassing anybody or asking them anything they really don't want to talk about and try to make it a fun interview for the listener as well as the interviewee. And generally it's worked out, but there's some interviews I could have done better than I did. Well, I think it's worked in any that I've seen at the Economic Club and of course on Bloomberg and PBS. So here you've written how to lead. Uh, you're capturing the essence of these unique conversations, drawing people out, some of the most fascinating people on the planet. And when you think of the diversity of the people that you've interviewed in this book, Christine Lagarde, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Tim Cook, Jamie Dimon, Oprah, are there any qualities of leadership that you find common among them? Sure. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I think leaders probably come from lower uh, income groups or maybe middle income. You generally don't see people who have inherited a billion dollars or $2 billion or their parents were in the Forbes 400 and they became great leaders. That rarely happens. Usually you have people who are striving to make something of themselves. And there are a number of common characteristics that I found that all of them have. One is they really want to be a leader. Two, they have had some luck. They recognize that. Three, they uh, have failed. They uh, recognize that failure is very important. Four, they persist. They recognize that you have to pick yourself up off the floor when you failed and persist, persist, persist. And also they share the credit. As Ronald Reagan, who you covered, said many times, uh, there's no limit to what humans can accomplish if they're willing to share the credit. I think great leaders do that. And I think leaders also have in common their ability to communicate with their followers. They either are good talkers, good writers, or mostly they know how to lead by example quite well. So those are some of the common characteristics. Well, I'm thinking of Warren Buffett, since we just saw him uh, lead off that great little video. Warren Buffett just turns 90. He is still going strong, the world's greatest investor. And arguably, as you write, he attributes his success to his passion for looking at opportunities to invest in companies that will, will grow, will, will have an increase in value. And with few exceptions, never selling, thereby avoiding transaction costs, capital gains taxes, if it were that simple, I guess we could all do it. There's something special about Warren Buffett, and maybe it's his sense of humor, his self-deprecating style, and his ability to communicate, among other great skills. Well, he uh, is unique. Um, he just did turn 90. I sent a, a video for his birthday saying, I really don't like him that much because he makes me look bad. He makes all of us look bad because he's so successful with everything he does. And I hope that he might fail somewhat between the age of 90 and 100 so he can make us all look a little bit better. But his secret is that he defied uh, the common wisdom. He didn't stay in New York. Um, he actually wanted to go to Harvard Business School, got turned down. He um, 
I went to your alma mater for two years as an undergraduate, then he left and went back to the University of Nebraska, but he built up his business in Omaha, which nobody thought you could do. How can you do great investing from Omaha? He also has the uh, ability to stick to his knitting and he really knows what he knows and he doesn't try to do things he doesn't know. And it's obviously worked out wonderfully for his investors. But the most important thing about Warren, he doesn't care about the money. He doesn't spend any of it. I mean, he's now giving it all away, but he shows that people who are business people that make money, it's the pleasure of proving their ideas or doing something useful with the money that's more important. It's not buying yachts and artwork and so forth that really motivates a lot of those people, including Warren Buffett. That is so telling because he does have that very plain lifestyle. I mean, he loves his bridge. He has other passions, but it's not tangible. It's not material things. Um, now, you, what about education? You chaired this board at Duke. You're a fellow on the Harvard Corporation. You serve on the boards of Johns Hopkins Medicine, the University of Chicago. Yet some of your really successful leaders have dropped out of school. Let's talk about Bill Gates dropping out of Harvard and the rest is history. Yes. I asked Bill Gates if he thought that he might have been more successful if he actually got his Harvard degree. And of course, uh, he didn't know it was a joke kind of question, so he kind of seriously answered it. But actually, <laughs> as it turns out, while he's the most famous college dropout, drop he would say it was probably a mistake to drop out because he thought the computer revolution and software revolution was occurring, and he was wrong. It wasn't occurring for another couple of years. So he said, actually, if he stayed at Harvard, it wouldn't have made a difference. But you know, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out. Steve Jobs dropped out. And so what it shows is that if you have a passion for an idea and you're committed and you work hard, you can do great things without a college degree. But as a general rule of thumb, for those of us who are parents, we say to our children, uh, you're probably not going to be Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, so get your degrees because the odds are better off that you're going to do well if you get a degree than if you don't get a degree. And another dropout is Richard Branson. He drops out at 15. You write about this, that he surrounds himself with great people. He listens to them. But you also talk about, you write about how he takes risks, calculated risks. One great anecdote is uh, that he started his airline because he got bumped from a flight uh, from Puerto Rico to the Virgin Islands. So he charters a plane and fills it up with all the other passengers and figures out, hey, this could be a good business. Yes, and it worked out. And he started several hundred companies. And I think virtually all of them have done uh, okay. Some have done spectacularly well. And up until recently, I think none of them have ever gone bankrupt. He's a person that took the name Virgin and made it into a brand name, and he's a risk taker. He's done some things that are death defying. He tried to fly around the world on a balloon, which almost killed him, uh, and he, now he's getting ready to take people into outer space. So he's a death defying guy, but he dropped out of high school because he was dyslexic. And in those days, people didn't know what, what dyslexia was. He thought, and his parents thought, he's just not that smart. It turns out that dyslexia is something that you can treat, and many people who or his generation have it did not get treated for it. And we know some other great leaders, Nelson Rockefeller and um, Nick Brady, former Treasury Secretary, who have acknowledged their dyslexia and are very active. Uh, yes. And, home uh, from the White House. Somebody I interviewed for the book, uh, that, that interview, but I didn't put in the book, um, it's Chuck Schwab. He was dyslexic and his parents thought he wasn't that smart. And he didn't realize he had dyslexia until his son came home one day and his teachers had said, you have a son who has dyslexia. And he said, what's that? And then he realized that he had he'd given it to his son in effect and he had it and then he got treated for it. Which is a, a great cautionary tale. Oprah, I mean, I remember Oprah back in the early Baltimore years before she was Oprah and her skill as an, as an interviewer is clearly that she connects to an audience and listens to people. And it was very obvious looking at her on local television where you probably, maybe when you were much younger, remember as well. I do. Uh, first of all, her name was supposed to be Orpa, and then it got misspelled on the birth certificate, so it became Oprah. But uh, when I was in college, my mother, who was in Baltimore, where I'm from, used to say, we have a terrific local newscaster, and this local newscaster is not going to be hanging around Baltimore very long because she's too good for Baltimore. And I said, well, I just don't know if she's going to be that good. And she said, no, she's going to be a national star. Of course, I didn't listen to her, and turned out that Oprah did a wonderful job. And when I did interview Oprah, I realized that Oprah doesn't need an interviewer because she's the master interviewer herself, and she kind of gave a master class in interviewing. I did ask her uh, at the time, Donald Trump had just been elected president, and I said, it's clear you don't need government experience to be elected president, why don't you consider running? And she played with it for a while, but I think ultimately she concluded that being Oprah is better than being president. 
I think that's that's been proved true for sure, right. uh, no matter whom you support for president. Uh, there's another trailblazer, Christine Lagarde, who uh, you know I know her well. You know her probably a lot better. But now she's she's leading the European Central Bank, so she's responsible in a pandemic, no less, for all of the throws in of monetary and fiscal policy in Europe, really, uh, and all the radical adjustments in post-Brexit Europe. She started out as a woman managing director at a large Chicago law firm, and then, as without having a PhD in economics, becomes the head of the IMF in a terrible crisis and transforms and turns that institution around, gaining great respect. Um, how does she manage all of these different talents? Well, you know, what are her unique qualities? Well, she would say she was always underestimated. Uh, mm -hmm. When she was a lawyer, she wasn't taken seriously because women weren't really practicing law. She became the head of the firm. No woman ever been the head of the firm. She became the first finance minister in Europe who was a woman. She became the, uh, uh, the first high MF head who was a woman, now the head of the ECB, first woman to do that. And she always thinks it's underestimated her was a, was a big thing because women were taken not as seriously by men in those days. And maybe some men don't take them as seriously today. As a result of that, she's been able to do quite well and proving that she's much more talented than many of the men who preceded her or who, with whom she served. But I said uh, at her farewell dinner uh, here that the key actually was this. She's a synchronized swimmer. And when she was on the uh, French national team, there must be something in synchronized swimming that teaches you how to be a good leader. So I thought about taking up synchronized swimming myself, but I'm not sure I'm a good enough swimmer to do that. And also at Holton Arms when she was a uh, right. foreign exchange student here in Washington or outside Washington, indeed. Uh, and at, at, at that farewell dinner, we also discovered that she's also quite a great singer. She is. She, uh, she really wanted to sing uh, an Edith Piaf song, and she did. And I would say to all the people watching, uh, be very nice to interns that you might meet in Washington, D.C., because you never know what intern might wind up being the head of the IMF or the ECB someday. And that's what she was. She was an intern for Senator Bill Cohen. That's right. Uh, and in fact, during the impeachment of Richard Nixon, which was a note right. with a year for Bill Cohn as a Republican freshman. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, when we think of um, a, a woman in a male profession when she was, you know, fighting the fight, and we know all of her history, the oldest justice on the court, the only one who was a rock star who has now gone through all of these cancer challenges. We see her coming out in public uh, just this past weekend officiating at a wedding. Uh, I'm lucky enough to say that she married us. So we, I know these, these are very good weddings that she does. But we, she looked great. Uh, and she keeps on going. And she also manages to work so well uh, with Justice, the late Justice Scalia, her close friend, through their shared love for opera. Um, yet she is a strong dissenter and has earned the respect of her colleagues. There's a lot of magic there. She was uh, somebody who was first in her class at Harvard Law School, first in her class at Columbia Law School, and still couldn't get a job. And right. basically only because a friend went to bat for her, a professor, that she get a job. And now she's clearly an incredible legal talent. And I would say the first rock star who's ever been a member of the Supreme Court. We've had about 115 members, and she's the first one who gets a standing ovation anywhere she goes. She could draw a crowd of 20,000 people. Many of the Supreme Court justices would walk into a restaurant and people wouldn't know who they are. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is different. And as I said to her, when I opened my interview of her, I, was, I think it was at the 92nd Street Y, um, how does it feel to wake up every morning and know that 330 million people want to know the state of your health? And uh, of course, she said something like, my half of them probably don't want it to be, be that good. But she's actually very uh, persistent, and I, I'm very confident that she will be around for a while. And uh, just the whole composition of the court, such a challenge as we head into another, what could be another contested election. And she is just remarkable in her, in her grit. You talked about resilience and persistence earlier. She personifies that. Yeah, she's, uh, she had a husband who she was really close to and Marty Ginsburg unfortunately died of cancer a few years ago. And um, she picked herself back up and went dug back into the court. And it's just been, a, as you say, a resilient member. And I would say uh, her intellect has, is, is extraordinary. She was a great legal student, a great legal scholar, and it's amazing that she couldn't get a job when she graduated first in her class from both of those law schools. Parenthetically, uh, there was another Supreme Court justice, the first woman on the court, Sandra Day O'Connor, who couldn't get a job when she got out of Stanford. And I was privileged to be in Aspen at a birthday party 
for the justice. And it was two weeks after Marty Ginsburg died. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg came with her grandson and spoke about what a mentor Sandra Day had been when she was terrified of writing her first majority opinion, uh, an assignment from Justice Rehnquist, and how Sandra Day just gave her the, the guts and the courage to get through it. So you know, I think mentoring is another mark of leaders. Yes. Evan Thomas has written with his wife, uh, Osi, a terrific book about uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. And uh, it mm -hmm. turns out that he did some uh, research in some of the letters that were behind in the Supreme Court. And it turned out that William Rehnquist had proposed marriage to Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, and uh, she turned him down politely, but they remained friends for quite some time. And they were both at Stanford, indeed. Um, let's talk about Tim Cook, because how challenging is it to succeed Steve Jobs and then become such a success, knowing that you could never be the creative force that Steve Jobs was? So the, the qualities that you know, Tim Cook brought to that. You know, in the basketball world, uh, up until Coach K came along, many people would say the greatest basketball coach was John Wooden, who won, I think, 10 national championships at UCLA. And the person who succeeded him didn't last very long. Because when you're succeeding a legend, you know, the expectations are pretty high. So when Steve Jobs died at a relatively young age, his successor, chosen by Steve Jobs, was Tim Cook, who was low-key, modest, unassuming, not the kind of creative genius that Steve was. And people thought, this company's not going anywhere. Well, the market capitalization of the company then was about $350 billion. Today, it's about $2 trillion. So Steve was a genius for sure, but uh, what Tim Cook has done is just incredible. And he's done it in a low-key, mild-mannered, self-effacing way, the opposite personality of, of, of Steve Jobs, but obviously it's work. Uh, there's so many, so many choices here in this book, so you all have to read it. But uh, one person who comes to mind is Jamie Dimon, who sort of breaks the mold of the, you know, stayed Wall Street banker, yet he, and he's had setbacks in his career. And again, this is that, that persistence that you talk about, that you write about uh, coming back. And he now symbolizes, you know, commercial banking uh, globally for, for yes. people. I would say that if Mr. JP Morgan himself were alive, he would say that this is his best successor. Nobody could have run that bank better than uh, Jamie Dimon. And he came back after being publicly fired by his mentor. His mentor, longtime mentor was Sandy Weil. Uh, mm -hmm. They basically uh, worked to take over Citigroup, made, built Citigroup, and, um, and ultimately um, Sandy fired him. And, and uh, Jamie had to pick himself up and he, he had a lot of different job offers. I offered him a job, uh, um, Jeff Bezos offered him a job. And uh, he said, no, I want to wait for a banking job. He got a job in Chicago, ultimately sold that company to J.P. Morgan and became, I'd say, the greatest banker in, in the world today, without any doubt. And he's managed to navigate, you know, all of these crises and still, you know, come out on top. He, he did quite well. And also, as, you, as I point out in the book, he had a very serious heart surgery not long ago. He woke up one day, wasn't feeling well. His wife, fortunately, got him to the hospital in time. A very serious operation, but he's now back at work, and I think his health is, is you know, reasonably good for this situation. Uh, I'm fascinated by some of the women leaders in business whom you've interviewed. Let's talk about Marilyn Houston. She was the first women, woman to lead the nation's largest defense contractor. This is a male's world and a male's world, and your clients are all men, uh, a lot of them in the Persian Gulf and other parts of the world, uh, less hospitable to women, and yet she succeeded so dramatically at Lockheed Martin. Yeah, the stock was up dramatically during her tenure. Uh, she's recently retired, but uh, she had a secret, uh, she would say, which is that she came from a family with uh, very modest economic means. She had to work her way through college. And then, uh, you know, it's difficult for women CEOs to have it all, and many of them do not have it all. But she had it all in part because she had children, successful career, good marriage, and she said that she was able to do it in part because her husband said, look, let me stay at home and, and help raise the kids. You, you're better at working at Lockheed. He had worked at Lockheed as well. And it worked out extremely well for both of them. The kids uh, did well and the, the husband was happy and Marilyn really set records at, at, uh, at Lockheed Martin. Not easy to do. Uh, that's actually uh, quite, quite typical of really successful women who have you know, families, who have children, that they have partners or husbands. Marty Ginsburg was the, the great cook. And uh, of course, her, her 
daughters all said that Ruth could never cook. Right. You wouldn't want to eat her food if, if, even if she tried. But it really is true that having a husband who sees the genius, if you will, of, of the spouse and wants to play that role. Yeah, it's not as common as maybe it should be, but there are many men who recognize that their spouse is probably going to be better at doing a professional kind of job. And so very often, not very often, but sometimes the, the husband says, I'm better at staying at home and I can make a better family for us this way. And it happened in, in Marilyn's case. Um, another woman who had a successful career and has recently stepped down, Ginny Romney, uh, she really transformed uh, IBM top to bottom as CEO. Yes, uh, IBM almost went bankrupt. Uh, Lou Gerstner kind of saved it from bankruptcy. Uh, Ginny succeeded uh, Lou Gerstner's su uh, successor. Uh, and uh, Ginny really made the company much more of a player in cloud computing, which it had not really been in. And uh, uh, Ginny did a terrific job. And she also, uh, um, as a person who did many other things, she became, I think, one of the first women to be members of Augusta. So she's got great golfing skills as well. She and, and Condoleezza Rice as well. That's right. Uh, how much of an impediment do you think not being able to socialize with men on the golf course or elsewhere is for women in business? I think for a long time it's been a problem because most of these, a lot of these clubs are, have been male only. Augusta was for quite some time. There's one in Washington that's male only as well. Um, and I think it was a, a problem. I think now people are more sensitive to it. And, uh, and clearly you can still be a successful person without playing golf. I, I don't play golf. A lot of my friends don't play golf. I play miniature golf, but there's not a lot of socializing there. <laughs> uh, I want uh, to also talk to you about women in politics. Uh, we now may have the first woman vice president, depending on how the election turns out. Um, you've profiled Nancy Pelosi, your fellow uh, Baltimore native. Um, what did you learn about her? that we may not know? Well, Nancy's father was mayor of my hometown, Baltimore, and he was also a member of Congress. And he had, um, I think it was five sons and one daughter, or four sons and one daughter. All of the sons were interested in government and politics. One also became mayor of Baltimore. But Nancy was not supposed to go into politics because she was a girl. And ultimately, she did what girls did. She married relatively young, a terrific person named Paul Pelosi. They moved to California. She had, I think, five children. Uh, with Paul, uh, four daughters and one son. And uh, she raised them all with her help of her, her husband. And then one day she kind of started volunteering in some uh, library uh, related uh, event in San Francisco. And eventually she became a member of Congress. Today, she's the most powerful woman in the history of our country in terms of politics. You know, think back on the country's history. Uh, we're, you know, more than 200 years old. And how many women have actually had that kind of power? Zero, zero. So she runs the house uh, pretty strongly, and, uh, but she's obviously still a terrific mother and, uh, husband and, and wife to, to Paul Pelosi. And uh, she's somebody that you could say probably has had it all. She's done it all. From getting to know her, uh, just covering her, I also realized, and, and watching her, at, at, particularly when she was speaking at Cokie Roberts' uh, funeral mass, she is a woman of really deep faith. And I think people who deride her do not understand that component of family and faith. Yes, she is a deeply committed Catholic and that's a very important part of her upbringing. And she did go to uh, a Catholic, Catholic schools and, and that was a very important part of her life. And, and yes, you're correct. Um, she's um, very deeply religious today. So, but she doesn't see that as being inconsistent with what she does. And you think about it, uh, she has so much power and all the prominent women that have been in politics and government and business over the years have never had as much political power as she has had and as she currently has. And I suspect she'll stay a speaker for, for quite some time. What do you think the challenges are for women in politics and business that are you know, unique to gender? Well, there's no doubt that if you go through the history of civilization, uh, men more than women have been the people who've been running government and, and those kind of uh, uh, political organizations. So women have had um, a, a enormous change in the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. But think about it. Um, it's, you know, I was born in 1949. It was, you know, only about 30 years earlier that women had the right to vote for the first time. And even when the right to vote was being debated, uh, many women were against it. They thought it was going to ruin womanhood. 
many women thought that that wasn't their place. And, uh, it, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt for a long time opposed the, uh, the right for women to vote. So I think about uh, it, we, we really have had uh, women voting and let alone op office seeking for a relatively short period of our history. Um, it is amazing that, uh, that, that society went so long that way, but, uh, you know, we can't rewrite history. Uh, and in fact, even after the, that event of ratification of the 19th Amendment 100 years ago, black women throughout many parts of our country couldn't vote until after the Voting Rights Act. Uh, That's a very interesting thing. When, when the 15th Amendment was being considered to allow blacks to vote, uh, women said, well, why don't we get in that amendment too? Because uh, if you're letting blacks vote, why don't we let women vote? Well, many of the leading blacks at the time said no. Uh, if you add women to the amendment, we won't get our right to vote. And in the end, um, Frederick Douglass, among others, opposed letting women vote. And so it went from, uh, you know, another, what, another uh, 50 years before women had the right to vote after the 15th Amendment. So just think about it. Suppose there were no 15th Amendment today and there was no 19th Amendment. The election we're having would look a lot different, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Women uh, vote more than men in this country. Uh, they are the majority of voters. Um, I want to ask you about Jeff Bezos, now the richest man in the world. Yes, the richest man in the world. In fact, almost the richest man ever. Uh, when John D. Rockefeller was at the peak of his fortune at the age of about 47 or so, he had a net worth that was roughly equivalent to about 4% of the GDP of the United States. The GDP of the United States today is roughly, let's say, $20 billion or $20 trillion. So 4% would be roughly $800 billion. Now, Jeff is worth about $200 billion, which is not bad. He's, so he's not as rich in, in some terms as, as, as uh, Johnny Rockefeller. On the other hand, what do you do with $200 billion? How can you possibly expend it or give it away? And Jeff is uh, a person who didn't start his company 40 years ago. He started in 1994. I mean, and they didn't have a concept that was unique. There were already companies that were selling books over the internet. Jeff didn't invent that. What he did invent was perfecting the way you deliver the products. And then he invented the idea of selling everything over the internet. So it's a brilliant uh, a business story. And, you know, I, I don't know if the pressure of being the richest man in the world is, uh, is great or not. I did have an interview I referred to in the book that one time I did an interview of Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos together. They had never been interviewed together, even though they're neighbors. And, uh, you know, it's quite interesting having the two richest people in the world there. And neither of them really wanted to be the richest person in the world because it comes with a lot of uh, baggage. But they're actually, Jeff has a, a pretty good sense of humor and, as you know, a great laugh. And he did speak at the Economic Club of Washington. We drew about 2,000 people a few years ago, and uh, I think it was one of the best uh, interviews we've ever had. And uh, philanthropy is now, you know, at the core of a lot of what you do, a lot of what, uh, led by Warren Buffett, a lot of what, you know, your fellow uh, very wealthy uh, financiers and philanthropists do. Um, how does that ennoble, enrich, um, gratify your lives? Well, when you're fortunate enough to be able to give away money, and I want to emphasize that philanthropy is a derivative of a Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. You can help people and love humanity by giving your time and energy and ideas. But if you have money and you give it away, I do think you're happier for it. Uh, people that measure their self-worth by their net worth, and there are people that do that, um, I think they're relatively unhappy people. The happiest people I know are people who are giving away their time, energy, and money, and feel they're doing something useful with their life, as opposed to those who are just uh, aggregating uh, net worth and just uh, going to die with lots of money. So I think from my point of view, I realized when I made some money that I was happier giving it away. And obviously, I want my children to have a good education and have a good start. But I think burdening them with staggering amounts of money isn't necessarily a great thing. And I think they've come to agree with that. When you look at yourself and some of the choices you've made from pandas to, you know, the National Archives and these great documents to the Washington Monument uh, and just all of the educational things that you've done, um, how, how do you get engaged? What, what strikes you? Well, I look for things where I can give back to the country or to organizations that were helpful to me or my family. But the things that I like to do are things where um, I think I can start something that wouldn't otherwise get started. I could finish something that wouldn't otherwise get finished. Something that is uh, 
within the likelihood I'll see the benefit while I'm alive. And then also something that I have some personal connection with. So I'm likely to stay intellectually engaged as opposed to just writing a check. And, you know, I've made some mistakes. Some things probably didn't work out as well, but generally I'm happy with what I've done. I have been surprised about this. The amount of money I've given away is large by normal human standards, but not by the standards of Bill Gates or something. He's obviously got wealth well beyond what I have or ever will have. But if I give uh, $10 million to fix the Washington Monument, you know, it's maybe nice or so forth. But if Bill Gates gives a billion dollars for malaria research, the $10 million for the monument gets more attention than the malaria research billion dollars. That's in part because a lot of the things I'm doing, not as many, as many people are doing them as I wish they would. I wish more people would give to what I call patriotic philanthropy, reminding people our history and, and heritage and so forth. But now hopefully other people will. But I'm happy with what I've done, but I can always do a better job. Well, one, one of the things about you and, and people like Bill Gates is Bill Gates has become an expert on COVID. Right. And on dealing with infectious diseases and all that they did with HIV AIDS and with river blindness and malaria and TB. But now he is such a voice on COVID. So he is, you know, to say the least, intellectually engaged and he's become a national asset on this, on this issue at a, in a crisis. Yes. Well, Bill was warning people about this years ago and people didn't pay enough attention to it. Bill has the intellectual processing power to process a lot of information in ways that average person doesn't. So he can actually understand a lot of the science, even though he's not trained as a scientist. And so therefore, when he speaks on these subjects, he actually knows what he's talking about. And I think people listen to him. And if Bill didn't have all the money he has, I think people would still listen to him because he's a very smart guy. Uh, part of giving back is often with people who feel especially um, responsible uh, for their communities. Robert, Robert F. Smith comes to mind, who is such a great leader and has done so many things in his community. Yeah, Robert F. Smith is a person who is the wealthiest African-American. He basically is, uh, grew up in, a, I would say, a middle-class uh, black family in uh, Denver, went to Cornell and later Columbia Business School, built a great private equity firm in the software area, and has now become uh, the leading African-American philanthropist in the United States and heavily involved in, in things relating to African-American history and African-American culture, among other things he does. And uh, he's just a, a very, very spectacular uh, philanthropist and business person. And he doesn't forget his roots. He, he, he does a lot of things with people in the Denver area, a lot of things with young kids. Uh, he's quite remarkable as a philanthropist. We spoke a lot about Bill Gates. What about Melinda Gates, who has such an unusual role that she's carved out for herself? Yes, Melinda is somebody that went to Duke after I did, and I've served on the board at Duke when she at different times. I didn't really serve with her. I've gotten to know her through the Giving Pledge, which she's a major proponent of and, and helps get the things organized. Melinda has carved out a niche for herself. You know, if your husband is the wealthiest man in the world, you can maybe get left behind a little bit. Um, but she basically carved out a niche and she describes in her book that she's written, I've interviewed her about, that sometimes she said, Bill, why don't we have an annual letter that includes some of these things? And Bill wouldn't take her as seriously, but she would push, push, push. And eventually she now, you know, co-authors the, the letter herself. One of the things she's done is try to help women around the world. And she's a committed Catholic, very ardent Catholic. And she's had to go against the church's teaching on birth control because it's her view that birth control is essential in places like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to keep people from uh, you know, having more and more children that they can't afford. And she tells heart-wrenching stories about going to Africa and having mothers bring their little children up to her and say, I can't afford this child. Can you take this child home for me? Hmm. And, uh, you know, but she's carved out quite a niche and she's also done a wonderful job. She have, they have three children. And uh, you know, I imagine being married to the wealthiest man in the world probably can't be easy because all the attention you get but uh, they've lived a relatively normal lifestyle given all the wealth they have. And here we are in this pandemic uh, where so many people have had to rise to this challenge. Um, what do you see as, if we can ask you about the, the way people can handle the economic transitions we're going to face? With so many of us working from home, um, my industry is never going to be the same because we have managed to um, figure out technological ways of editing and putting together our nightly news reports 
from home with everyone separated. And I suspect there's going to be a lot of distance work in other professions as well. Well, think about it. The Industrial Revolution took about 100 years to start to finish the where it kind of, um, we, we, we kind of transitioned from a, a less, a more an agrarian society to an industrial society. And then the internet came along, let's say, 20 years ago and transitioned a lot of what we do. But the internet and, and, and the world has changed dramatically just in the last year. Now, you, normally these things go on for 100 years, 20 years, but it's rare to have transitions. Everybody changes their lifestyle and the way they conduct their lives in a year or so. But think what COVID has done. We are now transitioning in this incredible way. But here's the problem. If someone like you and someone like me that has access to the internet, access to technology, and access to the best medicine, we're likely to survive this and we're likely to not be adversely impacted, maybe inconvenienced a bit. But those people that don't have access to it, people who work for small employers, small restaurants, food trucks, um, service industry people, they're going to be falling behind. They don't have access to the internet and so forth. They are going to fall into what I've called the COVID crater, which is they're going to be worse than they were before COVID came along. And that's a big problem. And while the, the stock market is doing quite well today, uh, the, the real economy has serious problems. And I think whoever the next president is, is going to have to spend a lot of time figuring out how to deal with all the, the unemployment we're going to have, particularly among young people and minorities, because they're going to fall further and further behind. Uh, one of the things I um, was also thinking is that when you look at the political leaders today, uh, we maybe it's a grand generalization, but we don't have the Jim Bakers and the Colin Powells who gave so much and others, you know, come to mind, um, you know, Sam Nunn, others in both parties who were real leaders in the Senate and in the military and in foreign policy. You interviewed Colin Powell, for instance. Right. There are so many unique qualities to this man who still describes himself as General Powell, not Secretary Powell. Well, of course, uh, Dwight Eisenhower preferred to be called General Eisenhower, and, and so did uh, George Washington, because it's a higher title in many ways um, than, you, than anything else you can get. But Colin Powell is an extraordinary individual, suffered from racial discrimination in the military. He was over in Vietnam, injured uh, many times, came back here and couldn't even get to eat in some of the bases in the South that he was, uh, when, when, when he was stationed, those bases would go out to eat and he couldn't even serve in some of the restaurants. So he's overcome a lot. I think had he run for president, I don't know what would have happened. He considered it, but for a number of reasons, decided not to do it. Uh, many people thought he would have been the first African-American president. Obviously, he wasn't, but uh, a great American uh, hero. And I think, uh, um, you know, was somebody that everybody looks up to. And in, in, in my view, uh, while he would say he made a mistake uh, in one thing in his career, at least one thing, which was when he was Secretary of State, he testified that there were weapons of mass destruction. Um, he did it based on best information he had. He would say that it was a mistake in hindsight, but he had the best of intentions and clearly was an extraordinary general and somebody that I really looked up to. And I think many young people, particularly minorities, looked up to Colin Powell and what he's, what he's done. But you, you raise a question that's very important. Uh, there were 55 white Christian property men who went at one point in time to the Constitutional Convention. Ultimately, 39 of those people signed the Constitution. If we were going to have a constitutional convention today, who would be those people we'd want? Um, think about it. There were no women, no minorities, no Jews. Um, and, uh, you know, if we had a more diverse uh, group today coming up with a constitution, how would it be different? Would it be better? And um, it's interesting that we are still living under a constitution that's more than 200 years old, but drafted by a bunch of, you know, white um, men who were propertied and educated. And uh, somehow we threw a 27 amendments, we've made the Constitution work, but it is an interesting phenomenon. Who would you want to have, uh, who are the people you've interviewed over the years, who would you want to have be at that Constitutional Convention? And, you know, Colin Powell would be kind of the, one of the people I would say he, would, he should be at the Constitutional Convention. And I would suggest Jim Baker as well. Uh, I've Baker. never met anyone in the White House who worked as hard at getting things right and getting, doing his homework uh, as Jim Baker when he was Chief of Staff and then on to Treasury and at the State Department. You know, today I'm now 71 years old. Um, Jim Baker, when he became chief of staff, he's older than I am. He, Jim is now um, in his late 80s, but he was only 50 years old. Today, it looks like a teenager to me, a teenager. But he was 50 years old and became Secretary of Treasury at 54 and Secretary of State at 58. And uh, those 12 years 
we're probably better government service by any one person at 12 years, non-elected official than anybody I've ever met or, or read about. And I, I want to also ask you about music and the arts because in the pandemic, our cultural institutions, we have some museums opening in New York now and here the Smithsonian, but our, our live performances have been uh, among the most severely affected. U.S. head of the Kennedy Center know that profoundly. Um, but I particularly loved on Bloomberg and PBS your Yo-Yo Ma interview. Um, I can say as a former violinist, a failed violinist myself, that when you tried to play Yo-Yo's cello, um, that one could say probably stick to your day job or jobs because you have so many jobs. But in any case, the interview with Yo-Yo, which is so lively and entertaining. Well, and his, you know, Yo-Yo was an educator also. Yo-Yo is the world's greatest cellist, but he's also, I think, the greatest cultural ambassador because he cares about the arts in a way that very few people do who are at, at his peak of his profession. He's not worried only about being a great cellist. He wants to be an ambassador for the arts. And in that interview, um, he did let me play um, a Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which has never been played as poorly as I played it. Um, and I suspect Mr. Stradivari was turning over in his grave when he realized that I was uh, behind one of his cello, uh, cellos. But uh, in any event, Yo-Yo is an incredible figure. And to answer your question about the Kenny Center and similar organizations, the Smithsonian, which I'm involved with as well, um, is now beginning to open as other museums and National Gallery of Art is opening and so forth. But they uh, do not depend on uh, ticket sales for revenue because the admission is free. Uh, the Kennedy Center, we sell tickets and that's about more than half of our revenue. So we've been struggling a bit because we just don't have performances right now. We, we hope to be able to have some things in the fall, modest uh, in the reach. And then hopefully in January, we'll bring back um, you know, more live programming and, and, and if the pandemic is a little bit behind us or further behind us and a vaccine is there. But all, perf all performing arts organizations in the United States are struggling now. All of them are struggling and all cultural organizations are struggling. It'll take years for them to make up the deficits that they've now accumulated, unfortunately. And we should point out that the musicians don't get paid if they're not performing and or for the most part. For most, some of them do. I mean, uh, National Symphony Orchestra, uh, they are getting paid. It's less than they would have otherwise gotten paid, but it's it's a problem in in many cases because some people who are not on contracts um, are not performing it, getting any paid. And the Kennedy Center, we've had to furlough and lay people off because we just don't have the revenue right now. And the performing artists like Renee Fleming, who's in your book as well, um, I've I've Renee. watched her on in virtual performances and you know fundraisers for for uh, the Met and Lincoln Center, but she and others are basically, you know, sidelined. Yes, I mean, Renee um, is uh, somebody that, you know, you can't perform operas right now or, or, or big concert halls, but she has done a number of these things uh, virtually and, and, and for the organization, not for compensation. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased that uh, she's now living in the Washington area. She's married to a, a, a very good man who's a lawyer down here. Um, and, uh, and Tim and she are living in Northern Virginia. And um, I think she likes it down here. Uh, if, and briefly before before I have to turn you back, um, some of the great figures in sports whom you've interviewed. Um, what is it, uh, as we just lost John Thompson this week at Georgetown, such a celebrated uh, coach and mentor and teacher, uh, it seems to me that the great athletes are those who are also great human beings. Not, not always, Babe Ruth and some others come to mind, but... Well, um... I interviewed for the book uh, two athletes, uh, uh, athletic figures. One is Coach K, and uh, because I've been involved in Duke, I've, I've known him for a while. He's an incredible person, won five NCAA championships, three gold medals for our country. And uh, he's more interested, though, in, in, in helping transition 17, 18, 19-year-old young men into adults. And he's done a terrific job. They, they tend to get their education unless there's occasion, there's obviously one and done, but most people are not one and done. So people get their education and he's created an incredible, uh, what he calls brotherhood uh, there now. And, and it's, a, it's a great story of what he's done over some 40 years. Uh, Jack Nicholas is uh, somebody I interviewed and he's uh, maybe the greatest golfer ever. He and Tiger Woods are probably the two best. And he's, now he's spending most of his life on philanthropy and, and children's health. And it's quite remarkable what he, he and his wife are doing in that area. And, uh... Briefly, whom have you not interviewed that you would love to interview? Well, I, 
one of the people I interviewed that was one of my best interviews, I didn't put it in the book, but I'm saving it for another thing was Alan Greenspan, somebody you know pretty well. And um, he was a good interview. He's, he knows his uh, economics. I've never interviewed Andrea Mitchell, so that could be in a, another book. So I have a few people like that I'd like to interview. Well, just judging from these interviews, I know that you will always find great subjects. Uh, well, I, I, that's not included, but it's, it is an amazing panoply of wonderful characters, fascinating leaders. Um, How to Lead is also a great guide for people in any field of how to, how to rise and treat people well, well and mentor those behind. Andrea, let, uh, thank you for doing this and thank you for saying it. But I wanted to conclude with this, this one. Um, I've done this because I want to inspire younger people uh, to kind of take role models, read about them and say, I can do that or I can do better than that. And so we need leaders. And I think if you look at role models and you kind of emulate them and improve on what they've done, that's a good thing. And generally, I want other people to know what it is that really makes these leaders tick. Uh, we sometimes read about these people. We don't really know what makes them tick. And so I, that's why I put the book together. And I want to thank the Economic Club of Washington for giving me this forum and for helping me get the interviews off the ground. And uh, all the proceeds that I would earn will go to the Johns Hopkins Children's Center. As you pointed out, I'm on the board of Johns Hopkins. It's an incredible medical complex. And the Children's Center is a very worthy organization. So I hope that... Uh, people will buy the book and the proceeds will go to Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Well, that's all wonderful. Thank you so much, David Rubenstein.